Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. Um, today we have a, a special episode called Behavior Spotlight, and what I do with Behavior Spotlight is I will pick one or two people from our level one or level two online learning membership programs and or in the projects, and we have conversations about what we're learning or just on the fly behavior consultations. Um, so there in the lobby, uh, we have Kimberly Perry and Lauren DuPont Smith. Um, they'll be joining us here in a couple seconds. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, Sarah. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. My name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're, weren't we just talking about our curly hair? <laughs> Trying to keep this stuff under control. <laughs> um, my name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center where we teach people around the world how to empower the lives of the animals and the people that care for them. Um, and we do that through our live streaming services. Oh, and I forgot to type out. That's what I forgot to do. Um, I forgot to type out the links where you can find the work that we do. Um, you can find out more on our website, which we're extremely excited that hopefully we have a new website in the process of being designed. Uh, we've been working on it for a couple of months and it's getting ready to switch hopefully um, this week. And it's all um, heavily focused around our subscription based services to make it uh, very user friendly very easy and an easy way for me to interact with everybody that's in our memberships and our projects. Because with me, it's all about, you know, in order for me to help the animals, I need to help the people. And I love working with people who love working with animals and caring for the animals, which is why we have our two guests on today. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, Adrian. Hey, there's Therese. Um, Quentin, Mark, Nita, Carol, Sharon, Shelley, <laughs> and the list goes on. Um, okay, let's get started. Before we bring Kimberly and Lauren on, um, I'm just going to go through some updates that have happened throughout the week, which some of them are pretty cool. They're all pretty cool. Um, if you want to find out about upcoming events, because we have several coming up, um, they'll all be listed. They're probably... Most of them are on our website. Some aren't there yet. Um, we're waiting for our new website, which hopefully will be done this week. But you can check in here on the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page under events. We list all of our events there as well. Um, and our email newsletter, uh, it's me. Um, I try to send that out every other week. I'm getting very diligent on um, keeping that up to date. Uh, we share a lot of important behavior information and training information. Um, you can sign up on our email newsletter here on our Facebook page. Okay, a couple of updates from this week. Um, Sunshine is the Lesser Sulfur Crusted Cockatoo here for training um, while he's still up for adoption through Best Friends Parrot Garden out in Kanab, Utah. Um, here he was yesterday taking a shower out in the center um, and I'm slowly, I need to get him out of his enclosure because animals that live in enclosures, in enclosures include our houses. What I tend to find is very common with animals that live under our care. If they are not constantly used to change and moving environments, um, those stagnant environments um, cause behavior issues. So we have con some concerns with sunshine, but that's what that's why we do what we do. Um, he's becoming over bonded with um, one of the other parrots and it's causing some behavior issues with him and one of the other parrots. Um, but if you want to follow all the progress sunshine is making, you can do that on the Sam I Can Foundation's Facebook page. Um, that's our nonprofit uh, where the board members are President, myself, Vice President Therese Copawoda, or no, Treasurer um, Karen Pratt, Secretary Dina Drenner. Um, so you, we're posting all his progress on the Sam I Can Foundation's Facebook page. Um, we, and I'm recording this because we're going through so much in the Parrot Project. Um, the Parrot Project is where I'm live streaming all my training with him. 
Um, where to approach a bird labeled as aggressive. We'll bite skin as soon as it sees it. How do we get it to move? We're teaching beak target. Here is yesterday. I took a snapshot of beginning stages of teaching a foot target. Foot target, we do foot targets to help with nail trims, getting an animal to step up if you want it to step up. Uh, but he's dowel trained. Um, we're going to start working on some crate training. What else is he, he's doing so much, uh, but the important part is we need to get him out, getting moving around and used to different um, surroundings and people and animals. Um, you can see all our live stream training with him uh, through the Parrot Project. The Parrot Project is um, one of the services I have where I teach people, one of the species specific ser services I have where I teach people all about parrot behavior training and enrichment. And that's through live streams, Q and A's, activities, foraging Fridays. Uh, we live stream with different avian professionals across the world in there, in addition to many other things. And Kimberly and Lauren, you guys are both in the Parrot Project too. Yeah, okay. Um, so another update, let's see, let's see if I can split screen this. Here's Levi, our deaf bulldog, our education bulldog, where uh, we took him on an outing earlier this week at Sylvania Family Services, and he did phenomenal. Next on deck um, to go for an outing is Cello, our roller pigeon. So the crate training needs to get started there. The target training, well, it's already started. Um, the recall training, how we work with recalling an animal in a large environment where it can run or fly off anywhere. Um, it wants to go. So um, something else we did this week, I'm working with a lot of different animals, but recall training an alligator. Alligator and fish are some of my um, most favorite animals to train. Um, and speaking of fish, I have somebody pretty exciting coming on deck here on Coffee with the Critters. Um, that's going to be talking about fish and fish training and fish care. Um, we're scheduling that for August. So he is going to, him and his cameraman are going to be a guest here at the Animal Behavior Center. So we're in the process of trying to figure out how to live stream this and bring this to you guys. Um, but the, um, we do a lot of our training, our live streams of training um, with alligators, um, zoo animals, exotics, um, in our level two membership that is focused more for people who are thinking about getting into the field of animal behavior and training um, or people that are very serious about it. Uh, this week we live streamed our gator training, leaner tra lemur training. I think I did some tyros. Uh, we did something else. Um, That's where we're doing our bear training as well. Um, we have group discussions in there. We do a lot of networking because there's a lot of professional animal trainers in there, board certified behavior analysts among uh, numerous other people. That is our level two membership program. So we also have our level one membership program, um, which Kimberly and Lauren are both in and they're getting ready to join us. Level one is our online membership program where we work with everyday behavior with the companion animal. People who are in our level one are parrot lovers, dog lovers, cat lovers, um, smaller animals. Um, and um, I know we have some fish people in there as well, but we live stream our work in there, monthly Q and A's, podcast. Um, it's pretty loaded. So with that, instead of me sitting here telling you about our level one, membership program. Let's go ahead and bring in our guests. They're coming in in three seconds to one. There's Kimberly Perry and there's Lauren Smith. Good morning, girls. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thanks for coming on with Coffee with the Critters with me. Um, I know Kimberly, you're in Long Island. Yep. Right? And mm -hmm. Lauren, you're in Northern California. Yes. Where it is now 6, 11 a.m. So... <laughs> I'm looking at me forming full sentences and everything. <laughs> but you said you're usually up a couple hours before I this. Am. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, we do this behavior spotlight once in a while, which I where I bring people in from the memberships or the projects, just to like we said yesterday in the test, just on the fly. Let's start talking about behavior, what we're learning. Um, and it's a nice way for other members to see you, see how 
um, get introduced to you. And um, Quentin's in here and says, hi, Kim. Hi, Quentin. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> so Quentin and Kim met each other uh, the beginning of June out at the C4AW event in Long Island. I have my shirt on. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> you have your C4AW shirt on? I do. Yep. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Um, and Nancy Forrester's in here from Key West, Florida. Hey, Nancy. Good to see you. Um, she's in the Parrot Project in level two, and I believe she's also in level one. Um, okay, so let's pick. I know if you guys, if for those, I know that Lauren and Kimberly, you can't see the people in the audience, can you? I can see some of, I can see who's kind of there if I recognize, like I, I recognize Quentin's little bird, um, but I can see the comments. Okay, you can. Good. All right. I can. Yeah, um, which is cool. So, oh, here's a comment from Julie Faflick. If you're in the Para Project, I suggest you also join Level 1 membership has really clarified everything. Yeah. So. I uh, would agree with that 100%. What? Yes. Being in both of them? Yes. I think <clears throat> they both have components that are just hugely helpful. The parrot project is near and dear to my heart because of my eclectus but i have a dog behavior is so well explained and you know laura i am a fanatic about your podcasts i can't tell you how many times i've listened to all of them because sometimes you know you get a little distracted and you might miss a couple words and you need to go back and clarify so I, yeah i i agree whoever said that i agree with you that was Julie, yes. And that's why I keep telling everybody, I keep checking in with level one, level two. Are you listening to your podcast? Um, because there's really a lot of detailed information in there. Um, I like to cover, a, like level one, it, the projects are, are designed to um, be combined with level one or level two, depending on your intensity of wanting to learn. Um, so in level one, we focus on behavior, um, the behavior of animals, no matter what species of animal. And then like the projects, we have the pig project, the parrot project, the deaf dog project, the snow project. Those are species specific. So people can say, I want to know more and I want to know more about this species. So they combine the two together. Um, so hopefully, um, I love that the, um, sorry, Laura. I love that the um, explanation of the behaviors in the level one is, is phenomenal. The podcasts really explain everything to, in such detail. You give awesome explanations um, and examples, not only for the animals, but with people too, which I love. Um, you know, it, 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 like I love the examples that you give, they, they're always great. And um, I actually found myself using some of the vocabulary in the parrot project, not realizing, like I, I think I posted a video of capturing a behavior and somebody was like, what's a capture? So I was like, oops, wait, uh, like not realizing that some of that terminology may not have been used in the parrot project because they may not be members of level one. So, um, but the, I love learning um, and relearning the vocabulary and, um, and just applying it. I love I really, I love the podcast. I, what I need to do is start pairing it with cleaning though, <laughs> because then it might increase my uh, love for cleaning. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, because I use right now, I listen to them in my car and uh, like, so I love them so much. I'm like, I'm, I'm really, you know, I, I have to, uh, you know, pair them with other things like first a CEU podcast and then a parent project or a level, level one podcast, because I find myself just listening to those solely. And I, I, uh, I'm addicted. I love them. <laughs> They're great. Good. And um, the podcast, is there getting any kind of aud audible feedback? I'm not. Okay. All right. The podcasts are meant for people to listen to while they're walking through the park, cleaning, long drives, what ha what have you, just to keep <laughs> Tell, there's a three-year history library in there, and I keep telling people, listen to them over and over and over um, because something may not be relevant to you right now, but it's going to be. And like you said, Kimberly, um, 
I will pick a topic on the podcast and we can talk about some of the topics too, because I can't even remember all the topics we've had. We can pick a topic and then just like when I give a live presentation to somebody, I love to talk about how it relates to human behavior because that's how I can get you, that's how I can connect with you. And then I start going through the species topic with different species because not everybody's going to recall train an alligator. You know? <laughs> um, but the information there, like I made a post yesterday on the Animal Behavior Center's Facebook page about recall training an alligator. I love working with animals that people think they can't be trained. They can be trained. The training is learning. Every animal is learning and they manipulate their environment to get the consequences they need. So do we. Um, so, it, I mean, people are like, oh, wow, I didn't think you could train an alligator. What do you train it to do? But the same, I hear that a lot from people with parrots. Oh, you have a bird? Well, what do you train a bird to do? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, what are some of the different topics? Can you, because Kim, you said yesterday, and I think Lauren, you did too, something about the podcast on crate training. I don't even <laughs> remember making one. <laughs> You know, I'm starting at the beginning because I only just joined in April. So I kind of started at the very beginning of the podcast. So I'm kind of probably not up to where Lauren is. Um, but uh, so I, I I think I don't know if it was episode maybe six or seven. I forget what I'm up to. But uh, it was it was in the early ones. Um, but it was excellent because it really um, went through every step of what needed to be done, including what, you know, I was working on with Bella, which was closing the door, um, which I would never have thought would have been a step until I listened to that podcast. And I was like, oh, and meanwhile, we know now after <laughs> my visit yesterday that closing the door is extremely important in the process. Uh, and then even continuing from there, you know, maybe uh, moving to different rooms or, you know, moving, you know, just outside the house and then, you know, coming back in so that it's short little trips in the carrier and not, you know, extended, um, you know, extended times in the carrier so that they get used to being in it, you know, for those shorter periods of time. And then you can build up to longer periods of time. Um, well, I kind of ran out of time. So my training. <laughs> right. You <laughs> stopped at that you were trying to get all freight trained for an upcoming vet appointment. Correct. Right. Um, I thought I had about an extra month, but it turns out that I, I didn't uh, due to just scheduling difficulties. So um, I really needed that extra month to finish the training. Um, for those of you that don't know, yesterday was Bella. I know some of the people in the Para Project have been following Bella, and we were working on crate training. She was doing excellent. Um, but we, we were kind of running out of time, and I was about – halfway closing the door and you know with her feeling comfortable um and that was you know the visit was yesterday so um she was not happy when she went in our carrier i did feel very defeated honestly about the whole thing um but i knew i knew that we you know didn't finish the training so uh, you know part of me knew that I, I was just hopeful that it wouldn't you know that our training of pairing and positive reinforcement you know in the carrier would have been enough um, but she she was not happy. She tried to get out the whole time, pretty much the whole time in the beginning. And then um, she was OK after. But uh, I thought it would have went a little bit smoother. So but the good news is yesterday, um, you know, you got to get back in the game. Right. So um, she rested for a while. And then last night um, we went back to training and I didn't even really honestly do anything. I just put a lure in her carrier, which was, you know, her favorite is blueberries. And she went right in. And I was like, oh, yay, I don't have a lot of counter conditioning to do. Because um, that was a big concern. I thought we were going to take a lot of steps back. Um, so she went right in. So it, it, it's a, so that was a good sign to me. So we just have to pick up now where we left off. Well, let's talk about you brought up a couple of different very important aspects in crate training. Um, like you said, if it weren't for the podcast, you wouldn't realize closing the door. Right. Um, her staying in, the behavior of her staying in and while you close the door is something you would have to train. That's a huge part. That is a huge part that is either going to make or break the training session. Um, Especially since she was uh, able to, you know, in the beginning stages, she was able to leave her carrier basically and end the training session really uh, when she wanted to, you know. So um, 
So when I closed the door fully yesterday, she was like, wait, whoa, what? I can't get out. <laughs> um, you know, so yeah, it's a, it's a huge component of the training. Huge. Yep. Because that closing of the door, depending on how you approach it, can either be a positive reinforcer or a positive punisher. And a positive punisher is an aversive. It, right. It's positive because it's added. The closing of the door is added to the environment. Punishment behavior decreases. So the behavior of Bella going in right. could have gone, it could have been positively punished. And this is be this is something you've been pretty serious on working with for quite a while. Right. And I know a lot of people get um, stressed about being pushed to crate train before the vet visit. Uh, yep, you as well, Lauren. Yeah, we had a, a bit of a medical emergency with Jonah about a year ago. And uh, it was, you know, grab him, jump in the car, crazy drive down the freeway for an hour. Uh, my veterinary clinic is an hour away. And uh, if, if he had not been comfortable going into that carrier, I don't, I don't know if he would have survived the stress, to be honest. Uh, so I was eternally grateful for um, the advice I had received on both the level one membership and the uh, parrot project. And now, um, as I indicated yesterday, I'm, I'm trying to enrich his world, broaden his life. And I, I got a, um, a cage that I want to transport him outside with so that he can see the world a little more, get the sun, get the wind. And so I fully, because of you, <laughs> I know just because I can get him in his little travel crate there's no guarantee whatsoever I'm going to be able to shove him into this cage and take him outside and have him be okay with that. Yeah. And let's talk about that because, I mean, even though we're talking about parrots right now, this can apply <laughs> to any animal. So a lot of people hear me say one of the most common mistakes people make are two biggest steps in their shape and plan such as shutting the door and walking out. You can punish all that behavior, all that training you just did. When, and Lauren, when you, I don't know, have you already started taking the bird out or are you getting ready to? Uh, well, his, I'm getting ready to. Okay, let me give you a little, little tip or something. I got to my pen with. here. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> me okay. too. Give me a tip. <laughs> I don't want to see the behavior progress that you've made this far be punished by taking too big of steps. So when I'm crate training an animal, and if that animal's light enough that I can pick up and move the crate, even if it's a Rottweiler, my Rottweiler sitting in the crate, the, once you get that door shut, the period of time that the, the dog, the bird is in the crate can either be a positive reinforcer or a punisher. Right. Um, so if you take too big of steps in periods of time, you need to shape period of time. So, you know, what I do is what is the end result that I want? I want this animal outside in an aviary. Okay. I need to shape all of that. So it could be stay in your crate for 15 seconds. Good. Reinforce. Bam. Um, open the door and in, in, in the reinforcer, you don't necessarily, if you have the reinforcer, it, if the animal's reinforcer is being let out of the crate, you're taking too big steps. Because what you want to see the animal do is want to stay in the crate. If you're delivering the reinforcer by allowing him out, um, it's probably not a very positive experience being in. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it could be, t we did this with Rocky getting ready for the commercial. I did this with Cello. I did this with all three of my dogs, um, a period of time staying in the crate, five seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, two minutes, um, that 20 seconds to two minutes, that could be too big of time because the animal, when you shut that crate door, no matter what animal it is, its choices are now limited. Um, and studies show that if you give people Choice A or choice B to pick from, they pick the one that gives them more choices. Um, so what I'm looking for is when the dog, the lemur, the bird is in the crate and you start shutting that door, it shuts one inch. Good, open, deliver reinforcer. Or good, 
deliver a reinforcer open. Um, but what I look for, and I, we did this in level two with Molly the lemur, Molly. <laughs> um, what I'm looking for is when the animal goes in the crate and turns back and looks at that door, that animal has control over that door. So if it looks at the door, boom, door opens up. Positive reinforcers are delivered for staying in the crate. Um, and what I look for is animal comes out, learning contingencies, meaning if this, then this, it comes out, blueberries stop being delivered. It goes back in, blueberries are delivered. Door is wide open. You have the choice coming in or out. And Lauren, just be careful because um, we're doing this here with one of our animals that's not used to being outside. I'm shaping the behavior of walking through the center inside of a crate, opening the doors to the wide open outdoors for a prey animal or an animal living in a stagnant environment, opening those doors and seeing the big sky and the traffic and the trees blowing, that can be really overstimulating, too much and a positive punisher. Just make, that's what I do, open up the door, come back in, crate opens up. Okay. But if you choose to stay in, then the major reinforcers, the highly valued reinforcers, and this is what we talk about in the podcast, the DIS, the four main factors yeah. of reinforcer. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. I love talking about DISC, the four main factors, because oh. many times all four factors are in the play in, in one one and a half minute training session. I think that probably when I started having better success with Bella, it was when I really, um, I had to kind of look at what was happening and it, it wasn't really going as quickly and as 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 well as I had hoped. Um, and then I was like, oh, disc, let's use it. Um, so she was no longer then getting blueberries in her breakfast anymore, which is her favorite. Right now it's her favorite, grapes were her favorite, but. Um, as we know, their reinforcers change. So now that blueberries are in season, um, they I guess they taste better. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so, so the blueberries, um, were only available in her crate. Um, and so that was the deprivation. Um, so she would know, and then I knew she understood the contingency, right? The C, um, because what I was finding is I always left her crate, um, kind of on the floor so she could, um, she likes to be on the floor a lot. So that was one of the reasons why I kept her crate on the floor. I know some people had suggested putting it on the table, but honestly, she, she's not, it's not a, it's not a comfortable area for her. So I chose to leave it on the floor. Um, but anyways, so, so starting to understand because she would go into her crate when she wanted her blueberries, um, so then I was like, okay, so, you know, when I would find her in there, because I would peek and there, there she is, she was wanting her blueberries. So the contingency, she understood. I want my blueberries. I have to go in the crate. Um, and then I would try to capture, when I saw her go in there, I would try to use that as a, as a quick training, you know, session. So I would always have like a little stash of blueberries somewhere close to me. And then I would, you know, try to bridge, um, which that's the importance of the bridge too, because... Um, she was a little further away from me, so I was able to see her in there good that's and then the right right and deliver the, the reinforcer of another blueberry. Yep, the bridge is your eye and disc immediately. That's a conditioned reinforcer. Bam, it needs to yeah. be immediate. Um, I see Samantha on here. Um, I just I wanted to pull her up. Um, she's another BCBA, board certified behavior analyst, and correct me if I'm wrong, Samantha. Because so are you, you are as well, correct? Yeah, Kimberly? correct, yeah. <clears throat> so do you see how this relates to, you know, these are about, this is all about understanding laws of behavior, no Absolutely. matter what the animal, even if it's Absolutely. human um, or the animals. Yes. And I think, Laura, no. regarding the podcast again, I think you do a very good job in a, a couple regards there. You put your mistakes out there. I am not a certified yes. behaviorist. I am well out of my <laughs> area of expertise in this regard. And you were talking about the crate training with Molly, the lemur. You said I made a big mistake. I shut the door five inches. And I was like, oh, she does it too. She has her glitches. She manages right. to pull it back, figure it out, move forward. 
but you also do a good job, which I think is really important, of relating these behaviors to human behaviors because then it sinks in. Your comments about whether or not a behavior is purposeless, that was amazing to me. And you know, I'm a huge fan of Snot Nose Johnny. Yeah. Because we've all seen this at Target. We have all seen this. And you, you give it the human perspective. You're like, oh, I think I did that with my dog or parrot or pig. I just reinforced that. Hey, pay attention to me. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> like, oh, okay. So I think A, putting your, your mistakes out there and then B, relating it to the human experience because I might not understand the lemur experience. I understand the human experience though. Yep. And um, so for those, remind me to talk about the stoplight. Um, for those that aren't familiar with Snot Nose Johnny, he's my fictional <laughs> character that I talk about um, in the podcast. He's, he's my human, my human brat. Um, that's, I mean, you want to see, you want to see behavior explode in all the wrong directions, go to a grocery store. <laughs> I, I start twitching because I, I see, I see kids, um, <laughs> throwing a tantrum and the mom catering to them. And that's what I talk about with snot nose Johnny while mom is trying to get all the groceries on the roller belt. Um, so, but it, you know, and I tell people once you start a, once you, once you start understanding the laws of behavior, it's a blessing and it's a curse <laughs> it's a because you know, now know how to use it. And it's a curse because you see it blowing up all around you. I have to just I have to just comment on that because my husband, uh, you know, so often he's like, he's always blown away because I'm always observing behavior, right? So that's what I do. Um, I'm a teacher first and foremost, but I'm I'm also a BCBA. But he was so I said to him the other day, I'm like, you know, you always do that on I don't know, it's like Tuesdays and Thursdays or whatever. And he's like, what? And I was like, he's like, have you you actually know that? I said, well, I said that's what I do. I I observe behavior. That's what I do. Um, I'm always telling my staff, you know. From the moment that my students step off the bus, if I can see them from the window, I am watching every everything they do, everything, their eyes, their their what their face looks like, how they're carrying their backpack, like everything, because those subtle subtle signs tell the biggest story, you know. So when that student walks in, I, I already know, like, uh oh, we're in, you know, it it might not be a good day because I can read the the precursor behavior, you know. Um, so, you know, behavior, um, I think what, for me, one of the coolest things about the Power Project and the Level 1 membership is, um, yes, I, I know all the, you know, um, principles of behavior, but applying it to animals has been like a whole new world for me. Um, and, and just even learning about like recall and stationing, I had no idea what those were before. Um, so, you know, I, and I've always loved behavior. It's always been, um, and actually you just mentioned in your podcast too, um, how you, your interest in psychology, um, I think I think that was in, in the one of the podcasts, you had said that your interest in psychology um, had brought you to love behavior. Well, for me also, um, on my undergrad degree, um, I always loved psychology and they always just touched on behavior a little bit, but then um, never really went into it. I mean, back when I went to college, you know, you never really heard of ABA, but um, I always loved it. And it was always something that I just really loved. And I, and I also love that you were going to go into broadcasting because I was going to become a physician assistant, you know? So my motto has always been everything happens for a reason because, um, that didn't work out. I became a special education teacher, you know, using behavior and ABA and, um, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, but behavior is everywhere and, and just, you know, watching it, seeing how the principles work. It's, it's awesome. I love it. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, with yes. you saying yeah. uh, how we, I love the fact that because behavior is always happening. And before I even turn a knob on a door, I'm listening for behavior. Yeah. You can hear behavior. You can see behavior. You can monitor behavior. You can monitor blood pressure. Those are all cues. Uh, those are all, they can be consequences. They can be antecedents. You can uh, apply behavior analysis is using environmental 
events to control behavior. It's also using observable and measurable behavior. Um, and I know there's some difference there with ABA and psychology. Um, with ABA, we're working with using environmental events and observable, measurable behavior. Um, is this happening? This behavior happened once. This behavior happened twice. Depending on the behavior, behavior happened a third time. Yep, it's being reinforced. Is that what you want to reinforce? Um, identify the reinforcer. And when you identify the reinforcer, um, sometimes I sometimes I'm working with an animal or I'm working with an animal where I can't identify the the reinforcer. I, I don't know what it is, um, but it's there because this behavior continues to happen. I will keep interacting, um, rearranging the event or rearranging the environment and through training um, to determine what the reinforcer is. And sometimes I'm like, okay, it could be one of these things. But the, the more I interact, the more I'm like, bam, there it is. Once I identify the reinforcer, now I've got the, the, the tools to change this behavior. Um, but yeah, you were commenting, one of you commented on mistakes. We all make them. That's how you learn. I posted one last night. <laughs> yeah. That and the only reason that, you know, as Lauren mentioned, you know, you're you're so honest about your mistakes. Um, I think that makes the rest of us feel honest about our mistakes. I mean, I didn't have to post the video last night about, you know, how it went with Bella, but I, I feel like other people could learn from that, you know, that, you know, we I didn't finish my training. And, and unfortunately, the consequences were, you know, what they were. Um, so, you know, I think just you you create a very open environment and everybody in the level one membership in the power project, I think somebody made a comment on that earlier um, in the comments here, but everybody's so supportive. It's such a supportive community. Um, and, and it's great seeing the progress, you know, like I've been following Frank with blue and, um, you know, it's just so great, you know, to just watch everybody's progress through, um, through their training. It's awesome. And we all make mistakes. You know, I'm a professional. I make mistakes in my classroom every day. I make, you know, mistakes with my training, but the, we have to learn. We have to learn from that. Um, and, and that's how we grow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Laura, back to your comment that behavior is always happening. Another comment yeah. that you made in one of the many podcasts that really struck a chord with me is, when somebody said, you ask, what is your, what is your animal doing? Nothing. Well, right. you know, they're never not doing anything. If they're alive, they're doing something, something. that <laughs> serves a purpose for them. Yeah. So the, the challenge is then to figure out why they're doing what they're doing and what purpose it serves them. Exactly. Lauren. Yep. Eye -opening. What's that? Eye opening. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's why, um, some people, do, and I always tell people, break it down, be specific. Um, well, my, my, my animal, my dog's doing this for no reason. I have yet to observe any behavior that does not serve a purpose for that individual. Um, even if it's something hitting its head on a wall, um, that behavior exists for a reason. It could be over threshold. Uh, the individual realizes it cannot control its environment. And then you better pay attention to those behaviors. Those are the more serious behaviors. Those are self-injurious behaviors, potential self-injurious behaviors, um, where now it's, you have a behavior issue, you're getting ready to turn into a medical issue, okay? Now you're gonna need even more intervention. Um, so I will try to prevent behavior issues from turning into medical issues. This is when you start getting into abnormal repetitive behaviors, stereotypical behaviors. Those, those more intense behaviors, those, that's what another reason that drew me into this field of work. Because I want to see these individuals empowered and those abnormal repetitive behaviors stop and shift to something else where the individual is getting more choice and now does feel like it has a sense of control over its environment. Even if I have to still limit its choices for that individual's well-being. If I'm going to take one choice away, 
I'm going to replace it with another one. If I have to take a choice away, because I know this is going to eventually turn into uh, a medical condition, um, I don't just rip that choice, that the one that I want going away, I don't take those choices away immediately, depending on the situation. Because you take a certain choice away that has served a purpose for that individual for a long period of time, you could actually reinforce the very behavior you're trying to change. So if I have an animal knocking its head on a wall, um, you know, there are situations where I will use a positive punisher because the alternative of not using it is worse for the individual. <clears throat> but before I have to use, those are few and very far between that I don't like talking publicly where I can't educate you more on it. But if, if I have an animal doing an abnormal repetitive behavior that's gonna eventually turn into a medical condition, first I'm identifying why this abnormal repetitive behavior is happening, and then I'm gonna try to give it those options, those consequences for an alternate behavior. While I slowly try to remove this situation while I'm introducing another. Um, abnormal repetitive behaviors and self injurious behaviors for me, those are very emotional for me. I am a very emotional person. I, I, I do know that. <laughs> As am I. <laughs> but that to me, you, I've seen a couple of uh, live streams you've done where you had a moment and you always apologize. And that's one of the things I like. There's no need because we're here because we have those soft heart for animals and you just illustrate it for us, that, that, that that's okay. We're all normal people with an adoration of our animals or animals at large, and you having emotion about it shows you're doing it for the right reason. You're doing it because of them, not because of you. Thank you, Welcome. thank you, yeah. And that's why um, I'm very passionate. And like, if I see you in the memberships of the projects, putting your heart into something, I'm jumping up, I'm jumping in, grabbing your hand, and I'm going to show you exactly where to go because I can tell you are emotionally vested in the best interest of this animal. Um, <clears throat> so somebody on here said, Steve, oh, Stephanie Nash, could somebody tell me the name of the teacher is, please? I would like to contact her if possible. That's Kimberly Perry. She's on the screen in the middle. So it looks like you might be getting a message, Kimberly. Um, yeah, so all behavior serves a purpose. Um, if that animal is doing that behavior, uh, there's a reason. And um, I know, you know, separation anxiety is a tough one. That's a tough topic for where it's, it's tough for the everyday individual to address. And there's a lot of, I don't want to say bad information out there. Misinformation. <laughs> there's a lot of bad <laughs> you don't create and walk away from, from an animal with separation anxiety. You're probably going to get broken teeth, self-injurious behaviors, and you're probably reinforcing the undesired behavior you're trying to change. Which is, whoa, and there went Kimberly. Uh -oh. um, she'll be back. Um, I could tell she was having problems with her internet. Here, she's back already. Um, welcome back, Kim. Hi, sorry. <laughs> You're just done with the whole thing. Is <laughs> <laughs> um, Wi Fi. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of comments being said, and some of them are so long, it's going to take up the whole, like this one. But this is great. I mean, thank you, Sarah. It's going to cover all our faces. <laughs> so this is why I said yesterday in the test, um, make sure that once this live stream is over, that Lauren and Kimberly, if you want to go back and respond, because people are commenting to both of you, but it's happening so fast, it's hard for me to keep up. Um, so yeah, a couple other things we learn from our mistakes and even Samantha had said, um, even Samantha had said that, um, mistakes are made. That's how we learn. 
absolutely. Even as professionals. Um, so and if you're not learning from your mistakes, then then you're you know not taking advantage of um, you're not improving the lives of those people um, in your care or or your animals because we are all going to make mistakes. We're all human. Um, you know, like at, at my where I work, you know, if we have a crisis or whatever, we try to debrief and, and talk about like what what went right, what went wrong, you know, what could we do better? Because that's um, that's how that's how we improve. We have improved the lives of, um, you know, everybody, including our animals. <laughs> I think it's sharing the mistakes that takes it to the next level because Laura doesn't have to put that out there. It's that if they look at me. I'm a rock star. Do as I do. But she puts it out there. And that's that's huge, I think. Well, thanks. Every time I go live for the public, I'm putting my neck on the line. <laughs> yeah, you really. Those You're brave. Boy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, every live stream coffee with the critters in the in the bird room. Um, yep. I, I was worried for you sometimes with sunshine, I have to say. I was like, oh, she's so brave. <laughs> putting your toes down there with no shoes on when that for I was like, run, Laura, run. <laughs> it's like, we're so calm about it. Like, I got this. I got this. <laughs> That's a big peak. Yeah. And you know, um, I was telling somebody, that was all on the Say I Can Foundation page. I was telling, so everybody was just like, put shoes on. This bird <laughs> is a little bit aggressive and is known to lunge. And let me tell you what, sunshine's like a monkey. I saw him, so he interacts in his cage. I was like, oh, man, this is going to be what I thought. Because I just watched him go like this. He'll sit there and look at something, and all of a sudden he'll be like, boom, and he's jumped to something else. And I'm just like, that's potentially my head. <laughs> but the reason I don't wear shoes, why I like to not wear shoes when I'm with sunshine is because I can run faster in my bird. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah. So, and even like um, Samantha says, neck on the line with the gators. When I'm working with these gators, um, there is not a lot of room for error. An error could be a big mistake. So I don't put myself in that situation. A lot of times when I'm working with an animal that I, an individual that I do not understand, I'm not familiar with your behaviors, I am working off contact. There's no skin on scales happening. <laughs> um, there's no skin on feathers happening. And then I'll move to, you know, off contact and protective contact. So when I go in with those gators, if I make them, and I'm going in, if I make a mistake, I'm not going to be missing an appendage because of it. I will stay protected um, because I do know through working with, um, although I'm trying to think of an animal, um, a little budgie, you know what I mean? People are like, oh, I don't mind because it doesn't hurt. Well, I do mind because that animal's giving that behavior to tell you it serves a purpose to tell you to go away. I'm not comfortable with this, but yet you keep pushing because it doesn't hurt. That's when I tell people, come here, let me introduce you to the turkey vulture. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be able to make that mistake once. And Willie over the door attacking people as they tried to get to the restroom was one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> As scary as the gators are, the macaques are the ones I'm like, you're nuts. You're just nuts for dealing with, uh, not monkeys. <laughs> yeah, some people really enjoy working with primates. Some people really don't. In Makaya the macaque, that is one. You have very little room for error. And if you make a mistake, you better make sure there's distance between you. Um, those... It's the animals that, it's the, the, the ones that have the tougher behavior issues that are my biggest teachers. Because I can learn tons from that. I learn a ton from Snow, our deaf and blind dog. I never trained a deaf and blind animal before I met Snow. And people are like, you know, Joel Vitovic, he's a BCBA here in town that uh, I consider him one of my mentors. I adore him. He's works down here at the Autism Model School, which, let's have him on Coffee with the Critters again. Everybody mm -hmm. loves Joel. But um, what was I talking about? Darn it. The, the tough behaviors are your biggest teachers, is what you were. Yeah. Darn it. Okay, I forgot. It'll come to me in a couple minutes. Um, 
Hmm, I can't remember. Anyways, I have a couple of things. Um, I want, oh, you know, Joel in the Autism Model School, he sent the whole staff here for a two day workshop. That is so cool. Yep. And you know, the thing after the two day workshop, I asked for their feedback. And we did a bunch of group discussions. Joel was very involved with um, how do these laws of behavior that we're learning relate to our kids in the classroom. And the number one thing the staff said when they left is we're taking two biggest steps with our kids. We're taking two biggest steps with our kids. Um, so I remember Cello the pigeon, we were working with him. Now I've got a bunch of people in here that are not used to working with animals, let alone working with birds. So Cello the roller pigeon came down to the table and I just told everybody using environmental events to control behavior. Don't anybody make any quick moves because you're either going, you're probably going to positively punish the behavior of him standing on the table in front of you. You make too big of a move. That's fine. It's fine for cello because he's just going to fly 50 feet up into the rafters. And now you got to get that bird back down here. And what was really cool is I'm a big proponent of target training because target training we are doing so much target training and we don't even know. I target train eye contact with the pig, with the dog, because with, with Levi, because he can't hear me. So how am I going to communicate good job if he's not looking at me? Um, so we're That's another great podcast too. <laughs> what, the target training? Yeah, it was great. Because Thanks. you talked about all the different types of target training, like you said, you know, targeting to a cell phone, I think, was one of the ones you, you, you talked about to take a picture so that you didn't get the undesired behavior. Um, you know, it, it was really eye opening for me because I just thought of the target training with the target stick. Yeah. But it's so much more than that. Target training can build confidence. It can help shape um, get you to the behavior. So a couple of different examples, examples of target training. Milo will charge and bite you. Milo is our mini pig. He will charge and bite you if he's not comfortable, if you push him past his comfort level. Not everybody understands pigs that walks in this door. So for me to control behavior, I everybody wants to take a picture of pig. Pigs are cute. <laughs> well, most people think pigs cute. So I train him, when a phone comes out like this, your eyeballs go right there. And so people get down in his face like this, and that could be an aversive, he could charge, but he's already trained, oh, you're taking, well, he may not understand you're taking my picture, but he knows when this happens, stop chewing, stop moving. Um, what I do want you to be, do is be still and look straight at the camera. And that's how I can control Milo's behavior and shape his comfort level with that individual. So target training can be eye contact. Target training can be dog's nose to hand. Uh, we talked about this, I think, in level one, how we were working with somebody, I want to say it was in New York, about controlling their dog's behavior, um, yes. focusing on you versus chasing squirrels. Um, I know Leah in level one, she works at a zoo as well. And she's sitting down, she so she commented, she was so excited about what she's learning in level one that they have sessions every week where they sit down and say, okay, how can we do better awesome. um, with all the animals? But the different target training is nose to hand, beak to target stick, foot to like target training, Quincy to step on a ladder, foot to a ladder, you can do back, target, back leg targets, um, butt targets. We do butt targets for temperature taking, um, arm target for blood draw, neck target for jugular blood draw. Um, a lot of times target training is how I start recall with an animal. When you come over here, if you touch the mm -hmm. stick over here, that's that animal coming towards you to touch the stick. I yeah. did that with Bella with the target stick initially. Okay, good. So you yeah, when we were starting recall, I, I used the target stick and, and uh, you know, had her just uh, go on, touch the target stick and come on my arm um, and when we first started. 
because she knew that she was familiar with the target stick. Yep. And, and a lot of people I hear um, say the target stick is the magic wand. Um, I, <laughs> I like that they say that. <clears throat> and that also lets me know I need to explain contingency a little more here. If this, then this. This is why I tell people, if you're not using the target stick, go sit it on top of the refrigerator. Right. Because you, what, if you don't, if you lay it on the table or the ground, you'll see the animal come over and touch it because it has a history of reinforcement. And then all of a sudden, you're not paying attention to deliver a positive reinforcer. So this target is not going to be as meaningful to the animal anymore. But if you go set it on top of the refrigerator, it's out of sight. Um, animal can't really readily touch it. But then all of a sudden it comes out. When I bring out a target stick, you'll see a pig run to a station. The dogs <laughs> with their marks. You'll see all the parrots come down on their stations because this has earned contingency. This is now a cue of what's getting ready to happen. And no, if that you hear me say, if that animal can see, hear, smell, or feel you, you are training it, whether you realize it or not. The key question is, what are you training it to do? And misdelivery of attention is the number one reason animals are in shelters. People don't understand that they've unknowingly reinforced all kinds of undesired behaviors with attention. Yeah. So um, we're coming up on the hour, but one thing I didn't talk about that I wanted to talk about that I ask you guys, and we'll do this, uh, we do this in level one where I bring up certain activities. And tell me if you guys do this, where I always say, think about behavior on the road. Think about behavior while you're driving to work. You're at the stoplight. I always ask myself, well, I don't always, but when I was starting to learn, I was just like, okay, this is behavior. I just stopped at the stoplight. Why did I stop at the stoplight? Then you can start um, understanding positive reinforcers, negative reinforcers. So you're at the stoplight for what reason? You don't want to get into an accident. You don't want to get a ticket. <laughs> There's two forms of negative reinforcement. Um, I'd like to live another day. You know, right. Yep. 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 Um, so those stop signs, those stop lights serve a purpose. Another example I give in the podcast are because I will find myself doing it. I get on the expressway. Somebody's in the left lane and they're going slow. That does upset me. Why? It's limiting my choices. Yes. It's you are, limited, you are now. What's that? I said it was all, it's all about the choices. <laughs> yeah. And you're limiting my choice. You're governing how fast I, you're preventing me from doing something I want to do. And five o'clock traffic, I just stay away from it because I do find myself getting into a type of a road rage. You know, I'm so, I'm in a hurry to get home. And then I get home, I was like, well, why was I in such a hurry to get here? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's all this unnecessary anxiety that we reinforce. Um, Quentin says, pass them on the right. <laughs> yeah, and when I pass, when I pass on the right, I am a, about positive reinforcement, but I don't ever I try my best to never positively reinforce a behavior I don't want to see increase. So <laughs> as I'm passing on the right, you're going to get one of these. <laughs> and maybe, maybe, <laughs> and maybe something else. <laughs> oh. Well, you guys, thank you. Is there any last things you wanted to say before? I know we've covered a lot of different topics. Just thank you for what you do. Absolutely. That's, it's so huge. So huge. Thank you. Thank you your, for being part of it. Your passion. It's your passion that I think attracts people because I know it attracted me because um, I used to, you know, I watched Coffee with the Critters and um, learned, you know, heard you talk about the memberships, but you're so passionate about what you do and it, it, it comes out your pores how much you love what you do. And to me that, you know, that that's a person I want to be associated with um, because I, you know, love positive people, but I also, um, I, you can just see how much you love what you do in your, in your podcast. You can just hear it. Like it's, 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 um, 
very noticeable. And you so, bring in other people with similar passions. Jason Cream, yes. the yes. Um, PDD talk with Dr. Driggers, that was huge for me because that is an issue with Jonah. Huge that these people too will take, they obviously have the passion because they'll be on with you at crazy hours <laughs> and are so willing to address the questions. And so you clearly care because you're not only doing what you do, but you're bringing in other people to help round us out our knowledge and our ability to care for these animals. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm very adamant about bringing people very knowledgeable, passionate people. Um, and all of us may not agree on the, I don't agree with a lot of things, but I'm going to walk away from this learning something. I may be thinking differently about something now. And, and you disagree, I will agree with you in five years. <laughs> you disagree respectfully, which is rare in the world today. You know, everybody's got some issue with somebody over something, but you all present your cases and you respectfully discuss it and agree to disagree and life goes on and it's all a big happy family and that's greatly appreciated. Yeah, thank you, thank you. There's one of our former volunteers, the awesome Rachel Saunders down in Columbus. Um, thanks, Rachel. Um, I was gonna say something else too, huh, squirrel. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and that was funny. Like, funny. <laughs> before I started this live stream, I'm I'm always thinking about the memberships and the projects, and I'm like, how can I help everybody do better? Um, I know in level one, we're getting ready to bring in a holistic veterinarian that deals with cats and dogs. Nice. Oh, yay. And somebody I've been following for quite a while. Um, <laughs> thanks. Nancy Forrester says, blowing the contract for Lars' passion and knowledge. Yeah. So um, thank you guys so much for being on here. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate all the effort that you're putting into your work in the projects and the memberships. Um, I'm just typing something up here because I forgot to type it before, but um, i bring this back in here. For anybody interested in learning more about what we do here at the Animal Behavior Center, we have our projects and our memberships. These are our species specific projects. Um, you can always, our website is theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, we have our species specific projects, our memberships, level one and level two. Um, we also have our referral program, which many people, I mean, this is taking off and many people are taking advantage of this, um, where it, for every five people that sign up for one of our projects or our memberships from you, I give you a free one hour behavior online behavior consultation. I, I started that for the shelters because they don't have a lot of time for the training. So this way I could provide them guidance to keep moving forward. But now I'm offering it to everybody, every single individual. Um, and I guess my buttons on here have stopped working. Um, so, oh, we all ha also have the All Animal Species and Behavior and Training Workshop coming up in October. I believe it's the second week in October with myself and um, psychologist Dr. Deb Jones and professional dog trainer. With that being said, I forgot to say something when I was showing the alligator. I am starting up zoo workshops as well. So if anybody here is interested, you can fine tune your training skills through training exotics and zoo animals. If anybody's interested, and attending a zoo workshop hosted by me, feel free to message me. Um, so with that being said, that's our Coffee with the Critters. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, okay. everybody. Thanks for joining. And uh -huh. yeah, I think next week we're doing Coffee with the Critters with Dr. Deb Jones. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay.